I really want to start by thanking everybody for showing up tonight. Um, you know, last time I was in a room with this many uniforms was when I retired from the military in 2013. That was after 31 years of service. Um, my entry and my career path is a little unusual. I always seem to find the hardest way to do anything. So my route to medical school was basically through West Point, which they said, well, you're not going to be able to go to medical school from West Point, and I was able to do it, which was a bit of a surprise to both myself and my family. I was branched initially in combat engineers, and then was able to get into the Uniformed Services uh, Medical School, where I went to medical school here in Bethesda. And then after neurosurgery residency and fellowship, went back to Walter Reed and spent a year in Iraq um, from 2003 until uh, late March of 2004. And it was really during that deployment when I realized what the importance is of teams and the importance of the people who are on the front lines. And that's really where you guys are, and I use it for everyone. Um, you basically are what we call in the military the point of the spear. And the point of the spear are those people who make the first contact with um, the enemy. In this case, the enemy is stroke. So you're the first ones on scene. You're the first ones to do the assessment. You're the first ones to do the resuscitation. And that's where this whole chain of care starts. So what I realize is that we don't do anything by ourselves. And we're only as good as the people that we get to work with. And luckily, I've been able to work with some of the finest people in all of medicine at Washington Hospital Center and at Georgetown University. And we're trying to basically extend that care here at Reston to make that, in fact, an extension of the care that we give in uh, Washington Hospital Center and at Georgetown University. But it all starts with you guys. So I'm going to um, go through a couple examples here and a little dictation about what it is that stroke is all about. But first, I don't have any uh, financial relationships, but I got a lot of people to thank. A lot of the people are here in this picture. Um, my protege, who I trained, who's now the head of neurovascular at Walter Reed, is uh, Captain Bell. Captain Bell was one of my uh, residents back in 2003. Trained him up, fellowship trained. He went off to Afghanistan. When he came back, I said, Randy, you're in charge now. I got to retire. We got to be able to pass that baton. And just as you guys do on a daily basis, you're training the next generation to continue the fight, to continue the care. So that same thing goes on with medicine at hospital center. We're always constantly training, training fellows, training residents, training nurses, training PAs to continue the care. It's a big team. And the reason being is that when we do a procedure, it's not just one single person. You're basically working in unison, and you're working in series, not in parallel, or excuse me, working in parallel, not in series. Everybody is sort of basically coming down, and they have their, jo their jobs, sort of like a uh, NASCAR pit stop, where a car pulls in, patient pulls in, someone's on the airway, someone's on access, someone's on fluids, someone's prepping the table, so that things happen rapidly. Because the faster, quicker we are, the better the outcomes are for revascularization. So down below are some of the pictures of the rooms that we have. And you'll see the room here. The room here is fashioned on the same rooms that we have at Washington Hospital Center and at Georgetown University. These are endovascular operating rooms. They're very large, you'll see. They're biplanar angio suites. They're really specialized operating rooms. They're not really imaging suites. They're not radiologic suites as much as they're operating rooms. And we treat it like an operating room. So I want to make a comparison between acute MI and acute stroke, because that's something you're familiar with on a daily basis, acute MI. And the evolution of technology has now made it such that we can do acute interventions in stroke, opening up the vessels, rescuing the brain, from ischemia and infarction. And most of acute MIs are because of thrombosis. The vessel's atherosclerotic, and the clot closes. Whereas in stroke, it's basically mostly embolic. It's usually from the heart. We usually have a source, either heart, aorta, or carotids, that then fly downstream, or upstream, as most people think of, into the cerebral circulation. If it's a large vessel stroke, and you'll know that by the patient's exam. Paralysis, one side of the body. Loss of ability to speak. 
loss of consciousness or decreased level of consciousness. So large vessel stroke, big signs, facial weakness, aphasia, motor weakness, things along that lines. Then in fact, that involves a large vessel occlusion where we can go in with catheters, aspirate, and remove that clot. And I'll show you how we do that. So just like in the heart, time makes a difference. And we have a saying, time is brain. So just to emphasize, thrombotic for the heart most of the cases, embolic for the brain. When we look at ischemia in the brain, we're able to make an intervention because of a couple of reasons. One is because there's collateral circulation. So we have the core of the infarct, which is in gray here. That's the area that might be the dead tissue. But around it, we have a much larger area, which is the perfusion abnormality. So that's the area that we can rescue. So it's like a hostage rescue situation, right? You've got basically the brain being held hostage in terms of blood supply. And our goal is to basically get in there and remove the clot to then restore blood flow to that hemisphere. Because the perfusion deficit is sort of like a wedge in a pizza. It's much, much larger than the core. So the core, you think of the core of an apple, it's much smaller. Now we use specialized imaging to identify this. So not every large vessel stroke is something that we can treat. Some large vessel stroke, the damage is already done. There's a match between the core and the perfusion. Those we can't. But in the majority, we're actually able to do an intervention because the core tends to be smaller. What determines that? Three things. Time, the patient's collaterals, and the extent of the thrombus, right? So we can't give the patient more collaterals, right? We can't change the clot. But what we can intervene on is the time of intervention. So our idea of extending and providing this service here is that we decrease distance to target. We get closer to where the patients are, where the patients have ischemia or leading towards infarction, and we can rescue them quicker. So that's our whole idea in terms of the pathophysiology of stroke. So it's, it's fairly complex when you look at a cellular mechanism, you know, and this evolves, right? What's happening is basically there's an influx of calcium into the cell. The essential membrane of that cell is basically being broken down. And the sequelae, the consequence is that, is that swell, that cell's going to swell. And as it swells, it dies. Our idea is to basically turn the clock back on that by restoring blood flow. So again, this is a demonstration. Again, you see the clot. In this particular case, the clot's demonstrated in the middle cerebral artery. This is part of that core. And then this is the wedge of the penumbra. Penumbra means shadow in Greek. And here it's that tissue that's not yet dead. It's reversibly ischemic. It's what we're trying to rescue. So in terms of acute stroke therapy, you guys may be familiar with TPA. So TPA is an IV drug. TPA is given basically to treat patients with strokes, but it doesn't necessarily help those strokes where the clot is greater than a centimeter. So TPA is a clot-busting drug, can be given IV, but if it's a large clot, large vessel, it's not necessarily going to relieve it. So endovascular thrombectomies, where we go up with a catheter that we're going to talk about today, and we're going to show you the room where we do this. We usually do transfemoral access, arterial access, up the aorta, and then either up into the carotid circulation, into the middle cerebral artery, or up into the vertebral artery, into the basilar, and we'll show you some examples of that. That's part of what we call endovascular rescue. In the past, it used to be something that we had to do in less than six hours. But now with specialized imaging and what we call tissue clock, that window has been extended all the way up to 12 and 24 hours. So even if a patient's a wake-up stroke, you don't know when they were last seen normal, that patient may still be a candidate for a thrombectomy. We don't know this until we do specialized tissue imaging with the use of a rapid scan. So this is part of that technology. This is what we call a stint retriever. Stint retriever looks like a little stint that's attached to a little wire. It's delivered, again, transfemorally, and I'll show you some videos of that, where we bring it up through a guide catheter. So it's like climbing a mountain. Each step has a platform as we get to target. So there's an arterial sheath, 
There's a guide sheath up into the carotid. There's a microcatheter all the way up into the brain. And then through that microcatheter, we deploy this little sheath where it captures the clot. And then we suction aspirate that sheath, that clot, back into the catheter and remove it from the body. So a picture is worth a thousand words. And this little video will go through a little demonstration. Let's see if I can get this to roll. So this shows a thrombus now in the middle cerebral artery. So there's the clot. It's a large vessel occlusion. The patient is usually paralyzed on the opposite side of the body. It's dominant hemisphere. They can't speak. Our access is through the groin most of the time, occasionally transradially. We put a guide sheath into the groin. We then take a larger sheath, and we direct this larger sheath all the way from the groin all the way up into the carotid artery. And that then serves as a platform. This is a select catheter that goes into the guide sheath. The select catheter allows us to engage those superaortic vessels. And this all is all done under fluoroscopy. These vessels are much, much straighter than what we usually see in our normal patients. Most of our patients are hypertensive, and their vessels are like this. This is about the straightest vessels you're ever going to see, unless you see stroke in a young person, which does occasionally happen. So what you're going to see is we use a wire and a catheter to then select the carotid artery is in this case. Let's see if this will continue. Oh, go back for a second. It's a, it's a big folder, so. Bring us back to where we were here. So here's our access right about here. For some reason it froze on us. So it's selecting the, the common carotid artery. From the common carotid artery, we're then going to go into the internal carotid artery. That catheter acts as a platform. We then take another catheter through that catheter into the middle cerebral artery. It's sort of freezing on us here. So up into the carotid artery, and then we're coming through the skull base. We then bring another catheter up through this catheter. And then we're going to bring a microcatheter all the way up into the clot. So this is now intracranial circulation. So we take a small microcatheter, a small wire. We're directing it under biplane fluoroscopy up to where this thrombus is. So now we've crossed the thrombus. And the problem is you can't actually see the thrombus. What you see is a loss of filling of the circulation. Then we bring usually a stint retriever or aspiration catheter up into the thrombus. And that's where this next microcatheter comes. So the microcatheter comes around, goes up into the target. So that's our target. And then we have an aspiration catheter, which is the bigger catheter right there. And you can either aspirate directly, or you can use a stint retriever. So this is a direct aspiration, where it acts almost like a little vacuum cleaner, like a suction vacuum cleaner, and it sucks out the thrombus. And I'll show you what that looks like in another slide. So this is a vacuum pump that then is attached to that aspiration catheter. And then once we engage in that thrombus, we then withdraw it after several seconds to up to a minute. And then we repeat the angiogram. And at that point, once we repeat the angiogram, we're able to see an improvement in blood flow. So this is called an M1 thrombus, the proximal area of the middle cerebral artery. We're also able to go after M2 thrombus, which is the division beyond this. This is the ideal world where it happens lickety split with a single aspiration. That's not always the case. Usually we have to make a couple passes. And then we take the catheter out. We repeat the angiogram. So this is what a stint retriever looks like. And the stint retriever 
just to give you a quick example, is this metal mesh stint. Instead of just aspiration, we, we engage the thrombus using the stint retriever. And what you're seeing is that the microcatheter brings the stint up, the stint deploys, and it basically engages into the thrombus, sort of grabs the thrombus. So now you have purchase of the thrombus, and then you're pulling the clot out with aspiration and with the stint retriever, so a combination of techniques. This is a proximal balloon catheter. We've gotten away from that and just bring our aspiration catheter closer instead of using a balloon catheter. This then allows us to pull it all the way out of the body, out of the intracranial circulation. So this is sort of a demonstration of what it looks like with the aspiration catheters. This is an actual glass model of a thrombus being aspirated. And you can see it gets engaged and depends upon the nature of the clot. If the clot is very red blood cell rich, this works very well. If it's very white blood cell or you know, white um, platelet rich or white clot, then it doesn't aspirate as well. The white clot, the platelet clots, we have to use the stint retriever more often. So if we look at the number needed to treat, so at the bottom is STEMI, 17 patients to treat to have one good outcome, right? Whereas in stroke, in the original study, Mr. Clean, in 2015, it was, I think, eight patients. But now it's down to three patients needed to treat with the use of rapid study for those who are anywhere from last seen normal unknown or last seen normal wake-up stroke where we use the rapid study. So rapid study here, that little picture, the pink is basically the core, and then the green you're seeing is the penumbra. So we've really reduced the number needed to treat to get a good outcome in the, this patient population, as long as we've demonstrated that there's a mismatch between the core and the penumbra, and that we get to these patients appropriately before the two become the same size. So this is what I mean in terms of time. This is where time makes a difference. This is where you guys make the difference. This is where we all make a difference as a team by being able to do this quickly. There's a clock that goes on in that patient's brain. Some patients, as soon as they have the stroke, it's game over. And they're all the way on this side, where the wedge of the stroke is totally matched. There is no penumbra. There's no shadow that all the tissue is dead. But a majority of patients, we find, tend to be closer to this end left side of the spectrum, where they have a small core and a large tissue at risk. And those patients, if we move rapidly, we're able to actually make a big difference. So a lot of this has to do with what those patients' collaterals are like. And patients who have good collaterals, they can last longer than three, four, six hours. That's why they can go up to treatment up to 12 to 24 hours. And we don't know that in these patients. So if a patient's found down, we treat them as an emergency until we sort that out. Ideally, when we were first studying this back in 2015 and earlier, we said that without that tissue clock, if we just looked at time, we really wanted to treat these patients under six hours because that was the sort of 50% threshold. That's where you had to basically get your best revascularization. And that had to do with this curve called the Caffrey curve. But every 30 minutes, you're having a 10% loss of possible good outcome. So you can see delays make a big difference here. The delays occur in many spots. It could be a delay in extraction of a vehicle. It could be a delay in terms of an apartment getting up to the patient. It could be a delay in terms of weather. It could be a delay in terms of bringing the patient into the emergency room and then basically parking the patient in a corner and not treating it like an emergency. It could be a delay in terms of getting the imaging. It could be the delay on our part in terms of me mobilizing the team to get in to basically do the therapy. Or it could be a technical delay because of obstacles in the patient's anatomy. So there's a lot of areas for delay. So it's fairly complex in terms of what vessels might be affected. And it's much more complex than in the heart. So the vessels have different patterns of deficits and then we'll talk about what those patterns of deficits can be. But the important thing to realize is that it's much greater than just a three to four hour period. So in the past, it was thought TPA 
up to three hours, and the TPA got extended to four and a half hours. Then it was thought thrombectomy up to six hours, but now with tissue imaging up to 12 to 24 hours. So this is sort of the take home message, what I call fast and be fast. So fast has to do with the signs, you guys are probably very familiar with this, of a stroke. And we had that being facial droop, arm weakness, speech difficulty, time, call 911. You are 911. You are the point of the spear of 911. Be fast adds that of balance and eyesight changes. And that also ties into this being possibly a posterior circulation or vertebral basilar type stroke not necessarily anterior circulation, what we call the posterior circulation. So some other signs, confusion, new onset seizures, um, and a patient who's otherwise unresponsive. And it's very hard in the field for you guys to sort that out. One thing you can do is look at their eye movements. And you'll see in many stroke patients, large vessel stroke, they'll actually have eye version, eyes tilted off towards the side of the stroke. You guys may have seen that in the field. You look at a patient, check their eyes, and they're fixed towards one side. And that's actually a sign of a stroke. What it is, it's impairment of the frontal eye field on that side, and so it can't balance the other side. So the other side drives the eyes to look at the stroke. OK. Real world scenarios, what do we see? So this is more than just what you guys see in the field. What we also see is strokes that occur as inpatients, strokes that we have that happen in non-cerebral vascular patients, patients coming in for a joint replacement or patients coming in for a different surgical procedure or cardiac procedure who wake up with a stroke in our own hospital. Um, vitals might be being done, but there's no neuro checks. So that's a key area where improvement can be. Post-op strokes, patients who are waking up from anesthesia, we can see strokes in those patients because you didn't have an exam. Patient was under anesthesia. Now you have an exam that you can pick up a stroke. And then lastly, electrophysiologic procedures or vascular or coronary procedures where they have emboli that can fly off into the brain. Every 40 seconds, there's a stroke occurring in the United States. And that's something that's really important to understand, especially what we call in the stroke belt, which is in this area as is extending into the southern states in particular. So over 6.6 .6 million Americans, 20 and older, have had a stroke. But I'll tell you this, it's not just limited to older adults. Had a patient Friday night, transferred from Frederick Memorial all the way to Children's, and then from Children's to Washington Hospital Center, 17 years old with a stroke. 17 years old, one of the youngest patients I've treated with a stroke. Why? Why are we seeing young people with stroke? Well, it's a combination of probably three things. One is underlying risk factors, like a cardiac abnormality, what we call patent frame and ovale, which this young man had. The other is with COVID. COVID increases the number of strokes that we're seeing as well. It causes a hypercoagulability, a thickness within the blood itself. And also vaping. So he had all three. He had the trifecta, the perfect storm, right? And his dad said to me, he said, can you talk to him about not vaping again? Well, yes, dad, but you should talk to him about it as well, right? So I think he's given up on vaping. Luckily, we were able to actually save him. So those three things, uh, risk factors with coronavirus, we're seeing higher incidence, increased vaping, and then underlying um, uh, structural abnormalities. But it's not just with people associated with coronavirus. Even before this, we were seeing an increase in millennials who are having strokes. We didn't really have a good explanation for that. Um, some of it may have to do with diet, exercise, increased incidence of hypertension, hypercholesterolemia, primary risk factors. And a lot of that was actually affecting, as you can see, the south and southwest, or southeast. So in 2015, we had these five major studies that were published. All these were within a six hour period that was a paradigm shift for us to start thrombectomy. And then beyond that, uh, we had an addition of uh, two additional studies, MR Rescue, and I'll go into the other study here shortly, where we extended to 12 to 24 hours. So some of the cardiac risk factors we have, this is a cardiac ultrasound showing a thrombus in the left ventricle, which can fly off. The other thing that we see a lot at Washington Hospital Center, because we're a major cardiac center, is significant cardiac heart disease 
heart failure, and with heart failure, the heart's not pumping as well, it forms a clot, and that clot then can fly into the brain. Structural abnormalities, the holes between chambers, the patent foramen ovale like this young man had on Friday night. The other thing that you see is you have patients who present with AFib. So you guys see it all the time probably in the field. You hook the patient up to a monitor and they have AFib. You don't see you know, a very regular rhythm. And these are patients who are also at high risk for a stroke, especially those patients who may not be compliant with their anticoagulation as well. A third area are patients with carotid artery disease. And these are very difficult patients. They can have what we call tandem occlusions, an occlusion both in the neck and occlusion in the brain. So they have a clot that forms in the carotid artery, and then a portion of that clot goes from the carotid artery out to the middle cerebral artery. And those are much more challenging to treat. We have to open up both pathways to get to the target. All right, here's an example of a patient. This is a cardiac catheterization. Patient wakes up, is not normal, code one is activated. So code one is what we use for a stroke code. So you guys might see this in the field. You call to a patient, potential stroke. The patient has a paralysis one side of the body. Let's say they have that eye version where they're looking to one side. You know that's a major large vessel occlusion. It's not a small TIA. In this particular case, what we're concerned about is the risk for aspiration as well and also hypotension. You want to maintain the patient's blood pressure because that blood pressure keeps the brain perfused until the thrombectomy is done. What's a worst case? The worst case is that, you know, the stroke is not even th thought of as a diagnosis, that the patient is brought in because the patient had a seizure and they attribute it to maybe a trauma or a drug withdrawal or intoxication that masked the stroke. So one is that it's not anticipated that this was in fact a stroke. The other is that the patient comes in and the ER doctor is most concerned about the airway, sedates the patient or paralyzes the patient and we have no exam. So they went to protect the airway which is appropriate but there's no baseline exam. So we don't know in fact that this is in fact a stroke ongoing. And then the patient may not be monitored. So this delay in activation means that we're not necessarily called in time, that the imaging is not done in time. So it slows down the whole process. So I use this picture of the perfect storm. Remember the picture of the, the, the movie, The Perfect Storm? The time to go you know, out sailing is, or you know, deep sea fishing is not in the midst of a northeastern hitting a, I don't know, it was a hurricane or what, but three fronts coming in at once. It's not that time to go out fishing. It's usually the three big delays, a delay in detection, a delay in intervention, and a failure to anticipate. So I try to teach people to be proactive, have an early warning system. So you guys are part of that early warning system. You call in from the field, you say, I have a patient I think has a stroke, and I'm bringing them to rest in. So the ER hears that, the ER starts mobilizing this team, and then the team is ready to, in fact, do rapid imaging, rapid assessment, and to call us in to do a rapid intervention, and that's what this is all about. And it makes a big difference ge geographically here versus bringing the patient all the way into Hospital Center or Georgetown. So in 2017, this study came out that we were part of, which is the use of the rapid study, where we saw that even with patients who were greater than six hours out, they still have a lot of tissue that's salvageable, and we're able to improve outcomes. This is the study. MR Rescue, where we were able to identify all you needed to treat, number needed to treat was three patients. Three patients to improve one outcome, which is a huge difference than what we had had in the past. So this is an example of how our time makes a difference in the suite. So the quicker we are, the higher the outcomes uh, positive. So shorter the interventional time, the better the outcomes are. In cases where we take longer, the likelihood for a good outcome is much lower. And we're dealing with very, very sick patients. You know, healthy people don't usually get strokes. I mean, there's a few, you know, with maybe a cardiac abnormality that might have a, an aberrant, you know, hole between the heart that shows up with a, a stroke. But most stroke patients you see tend to be hypertensive, obese, 
have problems associated with hypercholesterolemia, have bad vessels to begin with, right? This is a picture of a patient who actually, I don't know if you can see the outline of the patient, but the patient was too big to be helicoptered in because the patient was greater than the serviceable payload for that helicopter. And that's a real thing that we're facing nowadays. I mean, morbid obesity in terms of treating patients. This patient, we actually had to go transradial for the thrombectomy because the transfemoral was too much hostile territory, as we say. <laughs> that's right. So again, just to reemphasize, and I have some more cases to show, but I'm going to wrap it up here pretty shortly. The best case scenario is where we identify patients early. We basically get the early mobilization of the entire team, and then technically we're able to execute a very quick parallel intervention that is not delayed. We're able to open up the vessel and prevent a reperfusion hemorrhage. Reperfusion hemorrhages occur when we open up blood flow into dead tissue. So the idea is we want to open up blood flow into tissue that's salvageable. And I think I have some, I'm going to skip here to some pictures. All right, this is a CTA scan. This CTA scan demonstrates evidence of a thrombus. I'm going to point this out for you guys. So where the thrombus is, is actually in the brain stem. It's actually in the basal artery. So the circle of Willis looks OK here. And you can follow these vessels up, and they all fill in the middle cerebral. But what you're missing here is the basal artery. This is the kind of patient who would present basically with an acute coma and or maybe some balance problems or eye problems earlier and then progress to a coma. And what you're seeing here is a total absence of the top of the basal artery. So the top of the basal artery is gone. So this is over 95% fatal if this progresses. We're able to bring the catheter all the way up into the vertebral artery from a transfemoral approach, open up that vessel. And then after we opened up one half, we then opened up the second half. And then at the end, we had a complete revascularization of the basilar artery. And this patient literally woke up on the table. And there you can see. So again, this is basilar artery open and compared to basilar artery closed. See the difference. And these are quite remarkable. This is something that is incredibly deadly that you're able to make an intervention with. This is a more common scenario that we're seeing now. A patient who presents with a combination of a stroke, COVID pneumonia, and airway issues, right? So you guys get called to this all the time. And so this is a patient who actually had a paralysis on the opposite side of the body and had evidence of an active pneumonia. And when we do these cases, it's a a lot of manpower. We have to have double teams. We have one team on the inside in the hot zone. We have another team in the green zone. The people who are in the green zone are running equipment for us. The people who are in the red zone, the hot zone, they have to stay double scrubbed with N95 masks on, eye protection in. And they're basic, of course, under all that is your lead. So it's really hot. And, and nobody can hear you talking because You've got two masks on. You've got your N95 mask, and then you've got another mask on top of that. So these are really tough cases. So this patient had a total carotid occlusion, so no filling of the carotid artery beyond that stump, as you can see here. So that whole hemisphere was at risk. And then we were able to open this in stages. So the first stage was we got the proximal carotid open, and then we got the distal MCA open. So this is after we got the initial carotid, but now the MCA is not quite filling. And then this is after we opened up both. So this is the carotid open, but the MCA is not yet open. And then you see the MCA open. These are other areas of clots that we have that can be in the M2 distribution, a little bit more beyond that major vessel going to the brain, but it's division. And that's where we use a smaller microcatheter and a little stint retriever to aspirate and bring that in. Here's an example of that. So what you're seeing basically, here's the zone of the clot. It's a smaller branch off that big division. And then that's the area that's affected. That's a very important area because this area of the brain is where the motor strip is. So in this particular patient, if you lose the motor strip on the right side, you're gonna have paralysis on the left arm. And that's why it becomes so critical. And then this is after it's revascularized. And this shows you active dynamic movement 
of the microcatheter and then the stent retriever out into that distribution. So here's the thrombus right here. We're navigating it right up into the occluded branch with the micro wire and then the stent retriever is deployed. And then this is the angiogram. I'm going to go back here and play the angiogram. See if this will roll. Where that branch is then opened. Go back. So I think I'll wrap it up here. And now that entire hemisphere is, is filling. Just one last slide I want to show you as I conclude here. Um, In the military, we had this saying that um, you don't rise to your expectations. You basically fall to the level of your training. So it's very important that everybody is trained at the same level and is capable at the utmost in terms of preparation for treatment of stroke. This includes not only the folks in the field for recognition, but it includes the folks in the ER who are responsible for triaging, the folks from our radiology side who are involved in imaging, and then my teammates who are involved in doing the thrombectomy. We all have to be basically at the highest level of performance for this to actually work. But it starts with you guys recognizing a patient who has a large vessel stroke and then getting them to the appropriate place where a thrombectomy can be done. So with that, our goal is basically early detection, early activation of the team, rapid imaging, and then rapid revascularization. Thank you very much for your attention. So the way this works basically is that the patient has already been imaged with CT imaging that shows the core versus the penumbra. And that CT also rules out whether the stroke is a hemorrhage or not. So my focus tonight that we talked about so far is on ischemic stroke, meaning a blockage. But another form of stroke that we also treat is hemorrhagic stroke. The hemorrhagic stroke is not going to be treated here. That's treated in the operating room and the ICU. But it's still an emergency. This is our large vessel occlusion type stroke that we're talking about. So that has already been confirmed in the CT scan. And on this side, the far side, is where anesthesia is going to be set up. And we treat this space basically as an endovascular operating room. So what we do is the patient's head is positioned on this side of the table here feet are on that side, arms are down along the side. We gain access, usually transfemorally, and we're looking not at the head or at the groin, we're looking at a screen. And as we look at the screen, for those who are on that side, you can come around this way. What we're doing is we're manipulating the catheters as we look at an image, okay? So it's sort of like a computer game, if you think about it. You actually look at a screen and you manipulate a device, all right? And you're at least three feet away from target. So you can imagine, you know, that adds a little bit of stress and strain and opposed to when we're in the operating room, you're directly under the microscope on top of it. So it's a different set of skills. We call that endovascular, meaning that we're just simply inside the blood vessel and opposed to open surgery where we're exovascular. Here we're endovascular. And the idea that what we're trying to do is we're trying to navigate the patient's arteries from the femoral artery all the way up from the aorta, all the way up from the carotid into the middle cerebral most of the time, with the idea of suction aspirating that clot out or using the stent retriever to grab the clot and then pull the clot out and use it. Okay. Once that's done, we confirm on the angiogram that we've got normal blood flow now. That part of the procedure is over. We take our catheter out, we use a special closure device for the groin. The patient is then kept intubated from there. We either do a CT on the table or go back to CT and then up to the ICU. Our goal is basically to have the vessel open within a half an hour, the ideal world. Typically, it occurs anywhere from a half hour to an hour. We definitely want under an hour if possible. When you go beyond an hour, that's when complications increase. 
So some of the cases where they're most complex is where you have carotid occlusion with an occlusion of the middle cerebral artery, or you have a lot of twists and turns that you have to get by to get up there. And that's where we use different techniques using different catheters and different wires. So this is a radiological sweep. Time, distance, and uh, shielding is what we use to limit our radiation. Whenever we step on the pedal, we're sending photons out, we're radiating, so we minimize our fluoroscopy time. We also make sure everybody who enters into the suite has lead. Uh, that includes anesthesia team, the nerve circulators, not just the operator. The patient is not leaded, um, so we minimize the amount of exposure the patient has in terms of radiologic exposure as well. But for us who are doing this on a daily basis, we're at a slightly higher risk. We have radiation badges on our equipment to make sure that our radiation dose is kept at a minimum as well. That's another important thing. Um, this, I think of this space as sort of like NASCAR. You know, NASCAR, the car comes in, there's someone on the wheels, there's someone on a gas tank, there's someone on the shield, there's someone who's checking pressure, you know, for different engine components all at the same time. That's the same thing in this space. The patient comes in, there's the assistant team, and what they're doing on this end of the table is they're setting up all of the catheters, all of the drips that we use to basically proceed with the procedure. When we bring a catheter in the body, we don't want that to form clot. And so what we want is that catheter to be perfused with heparin. The other thing is that we don't want any air balls to go in from our arterial, uh, arterial lines to the brain. So these are IV bags that will be hanging over here. They have to be debubbled, heparinized, and pressurized, the big three, right? Because when you put a vessel up into the carotid artery or middle cerebral artery, you know, you don't want to give the patient a stroke with the catheter. So we say no bubbles. Bubbles in your bath, bubbles in your champagne, but no bubbles in your brain, right? So that's the key thing. Uh, in terms of heparin, each of those bags have to be heparinized because that fluid that's running through the catheters can also, by itself, induce a clot. So you want to make sure that we have anticoagulated that fluid as well. Um, so that's another key element. So that's somebody who's setting up the bags ready to go, setting up the catheters. Well, the other individual, the primary operator, is getting femoral artery access. On the other side of the table is anesthesia. And anesthesia is keeping the patient alive during the procedure. What I mean by that is airway, breathing, circulation. And these patients can have very labile blood pressures you guys have seen in the field. One minute, minute they're 220 over 120, next minute they're you know, 60 over 40. They're all over the place. They can have cardiac arrhythmias. They can be an AFib. They can have problems associated with hypoxia as well. The case I showed you with a patient who was COVID, those COVID patients can be very difficult to ventilate. In the, in the era of COVID, what we typically want for those patients to decrease the risk of aerosolizing uh, virus is we want those patients intubated before they get to the suite here. So intubated in the emergency room as soon as they arrive. And why is that? Because if you're doing an intubation in the area of COVID, you can aerosolize virus into the air and expose everyone else in the room as well, even with the N95, even with your other devices. So we really try to contain that. The other areas with COVID that we worry about is the circuit for the COVID. So we don't want to detach the circuit, minimize circuit detachment. So we keep it a closed loop circuit and we transport patients on ventilators, keep them on that ventilator from e imaging to here as well. It becomes another 